musical linguistic objects. <laughs> Greetings from Cyberdelic Space. This is Lorenzo, and I'm your host here in the Psychedelic Salon. And uh, while I'm a little late in getting this podcast out this week, some of our fellow saloners nonetheless pitched in to help offset a few of our expenses by either making direct donations to the salon or who paid for a copy of the audiobook edition of my Pay What You Can novel, The Genesis Generation, which uh, you can also download for free if you'd like. And these special saloners are... Jorge S., Stuart P., Timothy W., and uh, longtime saloner and supporter Erock X1 of Guyan Botanicals, which, by the way, I can also attest to as an excellent source of uh, many high quality ethnobotanicals, uh, herbs, teas, things like that. Also, I want to thank Colleen S. And Colleen, please don't feel like you need to donate again in the future. Uh, gee, you've already done more than your part. And uh, that also goes for Jake C., who uh, both bought a book and also made a direct donation. Uh, Hey, thanks for that, Jake. And finally, I want to thank John J., who not only sent in a generous donation, but who also sent me a great talk by Eckhart Tolle that I'd love to play here in the salon, but unfortunately it's copyrighted by a company that once threatened to sue me for uh, (laughs) playing one of their Robert Anton Wilson recordings, and uh, for which I beg eternal forgiveness from them. (laughs) <laughs> so uh, thank you one and all ever so much for your continuing support. I really appreciate your help. Now for today's program, I'm going to play the first tape of a two-tape recording of an appearance by Terence McKenna sometime in 1987, if the writing on the cassette is to be believed. And uh, since the tape came from the wonderful Diana Slattery, who has furnished us with a whole box of McKenna tapes, uh, all of which have been properly labeled in the past, well, I'm sure that uh, this is the correct date. And uh, thank you again ever so much, Diana. Now, this first tape, which is uh, what I'm going to play today, is the main part of McKenna's lecture, and uh, the other tape that I'll play in my next podcast includes the question and answer session that followed. And, uh, you know, I've found that often these Q&A sessions are even more interesting than his prepared lectures. So uh, we'll hear that in the next podcast. But after we hear today's talk, I'll be back with some more of my thoughts about Occupy Wall Street and the other Occupy demonstrations now taking place all over the world. But first, here is the one and only Terrence McKenna. There's no scientific truth or new paradigm can arise in a vacuum vis-a-vis the opinions of the general informed public. If it doesn't fly with the general informed public, it doesn't matter what degree of internal rigor it has, an idea is probably doomed to uh, a kind of obsolescence or, or a kind of obscurity. So this idea that I want to put forth, which is the product of many people's thought on the subject, not the least of which is my brother Dennis, and I've developed the idea in conversations with Rupert Sheldrake and Kat and Ralph Metzner and other people over the years, is basically an extension of orthodox evolutionary theory as it applies to the question of human origins And then, having once established that part of the theory, going forward to try and see what kind of implications this revisioning of evolutionary mechanisms might have on contemporary life and the way in which we relate to ourselves and each other. The orthodox theory of human origins takes the position that the evolution of human beings from higher primates was an evolutionary process no different than the evolutionary processes which had refined the mammalian forms which preceded the primates, nor is it thought to be any different from any other evolutionary process. There is no ontological difference hypothesized. However, I think that uh, using the language of the evolutionary biologists, 
we can show that there were factors present in the pre-human and early human environment that constellated a unique concatenation of events and genetic filtration devices which created the phenomenon of self-reflecting, uh, language-using, culture-creating animals on this planet. Orthodox evolutionary theory takes the position that as the African continent became subject to an increasing period of dryness, which may have initially begun as early as two million to a million and a half years ago, that the general tropical forest which covered the continent uh, began to retreat in certain areas where water was a constraint, and grasslands arose. The arboreal primates, which were occupying a kind of climaxed evolutionary niche in the tropical forests before this aridity began, suddenly found themselves under pressure because the forests were disappearing. By changing their gait and learning to walk on the surface, by changing their diet and learning to include meat, and, they, and by refining their symbol processing capability, they transformed themselves from tribes of arboreal monkeys into creatures much more like the modern baboon. In other words, they became omnivorous pack-hunting animals capable of moving over the ground at high speed and capable of exchanging a large number of vocal signals that related to... Uh, exchange of information about hunting strategies, splitting, uh, because, as I neglected to mention, simultaneous to these evolutionary changes in the higher primates, other mammals were evolving in an opportunistic situation vis-a-vis -vis the grasslands into the many forms of ungulate animals which graze on the grasslands of Africa, not only cattle, but ibexes and giraffes and many forms which are now extinct. These, the primates and the higher mammals then came into a relationship where both were competing for the grassland and one became the primary predator on the other. Now, the one of the curious and unexplained things about the major psychotropic plants that occur on this planet is that several of them are remarkably involved with the uh, human culture and the domestication of plants. I'm thinking uh, of the ergotized rye, which figures in the Eleusinian Mysteries. Rye was a domesticated grass that through uh, selection, had been bred into this uh, large kernel cereal grain. Similarly, the psychedelic mushrooms, which are most noticeable in nature, are the so-called coprophytic ones, the ones which grow on manure. In the Pacific Northwest, there are numerous species of very ephemeral mushrooms which grow in the detritus of the forest floor. But as far as we know, the Northwest Coast Indians never noticed them sufficiently to utilize them as a shamanic vehicle. However, the coprophytic mushrooms are extremely noticeable in any environment because here you have this golden or silvery or golden yellow anomalous object uh, standing from four to seven inches high in the grassland and because it is coprophytic or manure loving, they invariably aggregate in the droppings of these ungulate animals. Well, it's very clear that they could hardly choose 
a situation more opportune for their being encountered by uh, these omnivorous primates who are preying on these herds of animals. So that, and I should mention that there is, it's assumed that there was considerable pressure on the availability of protein in this grassland situation. In other words, everybody was running hungry. And if you've ever seen films or actually observed the behavior of baboons in the wild, they, are, they pick things up and look at them and they sniff the ground. And this is their main behavior pattern, is sniffing the ground and picking things up and looking at them and testing them to eat them. Well, uh, very, uh, almost, I would say, coincident upon these factors all converging on the African veldt, the mushroom would then become included as part of this omnivoric diet of these primates. Now, I mentioned... Uh, when I talked on the radio today, this very important series of experiments by Roland Fisher, who is one of the great and really un... Uh, he isn't given the credit he deserves, one of the great researchers into altered states. He's retired now and lives on Mallorca. But he did a series of experiments which were a model of behaviorist rigor. He had an apparatus which had two parallel bars which could be deformed by rotating a, tr a crank which would impart mechanical pressure to one of the bars <coughs> so that it would be torqued and slowly parallelism would be lost between these two bars. And he gave psilocybin in uh, small amounts to hundreds of people and sat them down in front of this apparatus and told them to watch the situation with the two parallel bars and to press the buzzer when they felt that the two bars were no longer parallel. And he did it with hundreds and hundreds of controls. All of this work was done at the University of Maryland in the early 70s. And he showed, to the satisfaction of everyone, I think, that the people who were given the um, subthreshold doses of psilocybin were able to pick up this uh, deformation faster than the controls, the unstoned ordinary subjects. And he said to me, jokingly, this proves, you see, that drugs give you a truer picture of reality than being straight. But it was quite so. What he... Uh, he didn't uh, then make the leap to ask the question, well, then what impact would this increased visual acuity have had on an animal which was including this mushroom in its diet? And the answer is, if you were, as a matter of course, where you were eating all protein available in your in diet, including this vision acuity improving compound, you would gain an adaptive advantage over individuals of your species which were not including this item in their diet. And, I, and there's, this is just as straight an exposition of the evolutionary mechanism as could ever be given. There's nothing uh, wild-eyed about it. And the conclusion is that very quickly any primate not including this item in its diet would, uh, would be uh, written out of the picture by being maladaptive. Well, that's what happens when you take psilocybin in the subacute dose, but obviously it would be explored at all dosage levels. Now, it has another curious property, which a number of researchers have, uh, have noted, a property of the mushrooms, which is that they seem to activate or stimulate the language-forming center of the brain, whether that's a physical location or simply a name for a set of functions. It seems clear that psilocybin, by its ability to inspire glossolalia, inner voices, spontaneous shamanic singing, etc., operates on the symbolic uh, uh, processing parts of the brain. 
These were, recall, pack hunting animals, which had already evolved a complex set of signals arising first out of their arboreal existence and then transferred into this pack hunting mode. So it's reasonable, I think, to suggest that psilocybin can be seen in that situation as a catalyst for language. It is a catalyst for greater visual acuity and hence hunting prowess, and it is a catalyst for greater hunting prowess expressed through a uh, greater facility for the processing of symbols. At a still higher level, it, this gives way, of course, to the shamanic experience that we associate with psilocybin, which is the visionary state that does not have any obvious evolutionary efficacy, basically because you lie down and close your eyes and don't move around and cease to be an actor uh, on, the, on the stage of, uh, of uh, Darwinian competition. So I think it's reasonable to suggest that uh, the development of language and the dominance of this particular uh, adaptation of the primates can be put down to the fact that there was a catalytic enzyme in the diet which was pumping this to the detriment of all its competitors. For instance, the, the other great apes, the gorillas and the orangutans, did not adapt the omnivorous strategy, did not adapt the running gait, and they are, of course, in danger of extinction and never achieved high culture at all, uh, except, of course, for cocoa. So, uh, <laughs> this, I think, is the hidden factor. Now, this may not sound revolutionary, but ever since the notion of a human descent from a primate ancestor has been articulated, the search has been for the missing link in the form of a transitional skeleton which would show that there was no question that one had become the other. And while skeletons have come to light, reflective of various stages in this process, it's still unsatisfying to the evolutionary anthropologist to try and explain the speed with which this process happened. The, the fact that in the last uh, 30,000 to 50,000 years, the brain of human beings has evolved more than in the previous three million years. And so what I want to suggest to you and to the community of people who are concerned with the mechanics of human evolution so what we need to be looking for is an exogenous catalyst to this sudden burst of primate development. And I think that it can be found in the presence of these psychoactive compounds uh, in the food chain. Now, at a slightly later stage, this as cognition and self-reflection and language are all beginning to template onto reality, it seems very clear to me that the cattle would be seen as the source of the mushroom. The mushroom seem, would seem to that mentality as obviously a product of the cow as milk, meat, or fuel, meaning the dried manure, burned as fuel, so that the mushroom was a gift of the cow, you see. And then the experience of the mushroom is the experience of this feminine informational matrix that knits everything together and infuses it with numinosity, but it is specifically feminine. So another implication of all this is that the goddess cattle religions of, of prehistoric Africa and the ancient Middle East are actually Trinitarian religions of which the, the esoteric third member of the Trinity is a psychedelic uh, compound, probably the psychedelic compounds contained in the mushroom. 
In the 19th century, in the first wave of comparative mythology, which was headed up by Fraser and that school, much energy was expended on the notion of the great vegetation goddess and how this was seen to be evident in all the cults of the old world, the cults of Tammuz and Attis and uh, Sibyl. These were all seen to be uh, particularized historical expressions of the great vegetation goddess. I want to suggest that uh, that this vegetation goddess was not a... They make it out as a kind of generalized awareness of the fecundity of nature expressed in the bounty of vegetable, uh, of vegetable nature, which I'm sure metaphorically it was that, but I think it's reasonable to suggest that it was focused quite tightly on this image of the mushroom. Now, the only previous foray into uh, trying to inculcate mushrooms into early human origins is, as I'm sure you're aware, Gordon Wasson's effort to show that the Ayurvedic, or I'm sorry, the pre-Vedic sacrament Soma was uh, Amanita muscaria. Amanita muscaria is an intoxicating mushroom. It does not contain psilocybin. The uh, spiritual worth of it seems closely bound to the cultural context. It seems very hard for people who have not been brought up in the tradition of Arctic shamanism to actually get a good connection with it. Nevertheless, Wasson wanted to suggest that it was Indo-Aryan people coming out of the Caspian Sea area and into Mesopotamia carrying with them a mushroom cult that they then deified as Soma and then forgot in the Vedic centuries where they were establishing themselves in India. I think that a, a different view might well be that these Vedic people, when they swept down from the Caspian Sea area, encountered a mushroom religion and that was a goddess cattle religion. You see, Amanita muscaria is not symbiotic to cattle. It's symbiotic to birch trees. It has an entirely different uh, kind of symbiotic relationship. So that I want to suggest, based mostly on the fact that I think it's clear that psilocybin is the kind of chemical compound which could have worked the kinds of changes we're talking about, to suggest that psilocybin was the factor in the environment, but that the story may be that these Aryan peoples had to accept the mushroom that they found the goddess people using and then carried that to India. Now, this tradition occurs as late in the West as the Eleusinian Mysteries, which Wasson made a strong case that the Eleusinian Mysteries were ergotized rye beer, that a non-toxic strain of Claviceps paspali was actually infecting the rye which grew on the Eleusinian plain, and that a beer was brewed out of this, which was the intoxicating sacrament of Eleusis. His case is very convincing. However, he doesn't mention the strongest competitor in terms of an interpretation of the Eleusinian mystery, which is that uh, Robert Graves showed that the recipes for the Eleusinian ambrosia always contained words which could be arranged in such a way so that the first letters, when read downwards, would spell out the word mushroom in Greek. This is called an ogham, O-G-H-A-M, and I'm sure you're all familiar with it. <laughs> and he showed that the ingredients of the Eleusinian ambrosia, which were always listed as honey, barley, and something else, and water, and he said, what kind of an ingredient is that? Everybody knows that water is an ingredient of beer, but he said the word water is always present in order to provide the letter which is necessary to form this cryptogram which explains that it was really mushrooms. 
the, it, it's interesting that uh, Greek culture is, there was a school of scholarship in the early 19th century which held that high Greek culture was derivative from Mycenae, the Mycenaean kingdom of which the house of Atreus w- were the ruling family. Well, this MYC sound is a mushroom uh, sound. It's philologically a clue. The, uh, the island of Mykonos, if you look in a modern Greek dictionary, for the etymology of the island of Mykonos, you find that it is the island of the little bald-headed man. <laughs> well, now I ask you. <laughs> so, Mykonos, Mycenae, these are words which clue us to the fact that very early, and the word mucus is also in there and, and lays the basis for mycophobia in, in later languages. So, so what's so great about all this? Well, <laughs> what's so great about it is, first of all, it offers, it, it, it provides a kind of mechanism for seeing how something as complex and self-reflecting as ourselves could emerge from the background of, uh, of animal nature without a deus ex machina without the hand of God intruding into nature, we see rather that it's simply a set of very sophisticated mechanisms of catalysis and filtration which promote certain things, a certain kind of binocular vision, certain kinds of information processing, and certain kinds of experiences which then language, you see, seeks to template. And they... The, these uh, pack hunting monkeys, once they had the sacrament of mushroom intoxication, had an object for the inner ocean of language to beat against in an effort to describe and encompass and communicate it that laid the basis for religion. The word religion is related and based in the idea of origins. Religio is the going back to the origins, it also has, this idea also has an implication for the modern dilemma of attempting to relate to drugs. I mean, what are they? Are they good? Are they bad? Are they the scourge of the devil or the portal to enlightenment? What are they? And I'm speaking now of plant compounds. How are we to relate to the plants which intoxicate? Do they drive us mad? Or do they return us to the religio, to our own origins? Are we to see the states of mind which they invoke as a tremendously alien? Or are we to see them as in fact uh, a way of going back to the primary situation in which everything that we call human found genesis? And I think that Uh, because science is the reigning religion of the modern world, if you want to change people's minds about something, you have to get scientists to change their minds. And what evolutionary biology, to its uh, detriment, has ignored is the role of all forms of symbiotic relationships in nature. The Darwinian idea of evolution is, you know, it's a world of fang and claw, and the swiftest, the cruelest, uh, the largest, the fastest, these dominate. The actual situation is has been seen to be now for about 30 years, but the implications are making their way very slowly into orthodox evolutionary theory, is actually cooperation is what nature seeks to consolidate and conserve. And it is the species which can make itself most uh, user-friendly to its neighbor species, which actually survives. That's why, you know, there is hardly a tree which grows on this planet 
without a mycorrhizal relationship to a fungi. A mycorrhizal relationship means that the tree cannot grow and live unless the roots are covered by a fungus which is a completely independent organism, but which mediates the buffering and transport of mineral salts and that sort of thing, and makes the exterior environment palatable to the tree. Now, I mentioned today on the radio, many of these relationships start out as parasitic, but a parasite is either an evolving or unsuccessful symbiote because there is no uh, percentage in a biological relationship where you kill the host. And this is what parasites do. They are lethal, and they spoil the party. They kill the host, and then the guests have nowhere to go. And that's a crisis for host and guest, you see. But... Over time, these lethal uh, parasitic relationships evolve into symbiotic relationships where each party is contributing something to the well-being of every other party. And this is what happened in the situation with the mushroom, the human beings, and the cattle. The domestication of cattle inco uh, ensured their survival we don't have, there are numerous ungulate animals that we can only see in museums, and it's because it was easier to kill them than to domesticate them, because they were either very wild and unruly or very large, and you do not herd mastodons. <laughs> so that the cattle, by being taken into the human family, then there is a reciprocal relationship. Human beings are no longer under such pressure to hunt. There is availability of abundant protein. The, gen the genetic race of the cattle are preserved. And all this is mediated by a mushroom whose continued existence is dependent on the continued existence and numerical expansion of the population of cattle. So this is a relationship where everyone wins and consequently, it is preserved through time. Uh, we know that in shamanic uh, tradition throughout the world, human beings are using plants to gain knowledge and to cure disease. What has escaped our attention because of our anthropocentric point of view is that the plants which confer these abilities on human beings are therefore made cultivars and taken out of the stream of evolutionary selection, and instead they become objects of culture, and are cultivated, and are preserved, and even hybridized, and uh, they, in a sense, become a kind of episome on the human genetic heritage. This understanding about how nature works is what is absent in the modern world, at the top of the pyramid and is what is making everything so lethal because we see nature we I mean the corporate elites the dominant uh, political ideologies see nature as an enemy and this is why drugs are taboo because drugs are these plant drugs are an immersion in this symbiotic field of information. They are, are reaching out to this original situation, which is very unsettling. I mean, we build cities and we put a wall around them. The desacralizing of natural space is the process of cutting it into grids and erecting flat, planar surfaces along those grids to cut out the influx of energy that is part of... Uh, of the natural world. Now you know from listening to me go on mm -hmm. on this subject that I believe that uh, this is all a plot of some sort. In other words, that it is no mere coincidence that this mushroom was there in those cow pies. But notice that it need not be a plot. It could simply be an extremely unlikely concatenation of events which leads 
to the production of self-reflecting thinking human beings. However, uh, the visual acuity, even the stimulation of the language center, these things uh, are, um, do not address the informational content of the experience of the mushroom, which seems to be that of uh, an other, an intellect of some sort, which is either the overmind of the species or a very unusual kind of extraterrestrial organism which drifted in here millions and millions of years ago and has somehow inculcated itself into the environment, or it, it is... Uh, it is like a, a, the world soul, that there is actually a, a, a controlling uh, governor of the planetary ecology that can address a species coherently in its own language. This is not something which uh, orthodox anthropology has to take account of and certainly is not in a hurry to do so <laughs> because uh, this challenges the most basic assumptions about, uh, about what is possible. Nevertheless, I think you know, that as we peel away uh, the onion of nature, things are going to get stranger and stranger and stranger to the limits of our ability to conceive it, almost. And that the, because of, essentially, Christianity, uh, we have been, our connection to the origins, to the goddess and the planet and what we as moderns call the unconscious, but that ocean of depersonalized information that you access with these plant hallucinogens. Because of Christianity, we have been cut off from this. Whatever Christianity was, it was a historical episode where the most patriarchal rap extant on the planet was suddenly pumped full of so much energy that everything else was just shoved to the walls. And, uh, and the submergence, the giving up of the ego that is represented by the worship of the goddess in the orgiastic and intoxicating rites that reached back to prehistory was suppressed very definitely in favor of structure and order and paternalism and these sorts of things. And it's drive as we might, this is the legacy upon which we must uh, uh, restructure our worldview. We can't do anything about the historical momentum that Christianity has imparted to our expectations. All we can do about it is raise it to consciousness, examine it, and then try and think our way around it. But it gives rise because it was the heir to the late Hellenistic tradition of dualism, it gives rise to these tremendous divisions between the natural and the human world, between self and world, between you and me, between life and death. You see, it's a, it's a, 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 a splitting apart, a conceptual syzygy, it's almost a linguistic strategy of conceptual syzygy, which leaves you no room to touch your origins. This lore, this understanding of human-plant interactions is slipping through our fingers at a tremendous rate. The last time I was in the Amazon, remember, I guess it was 83 or 87 or something. Anyway, we were on the track of a, a orally active DMT drug called Ukuhe, and it had only been used by two tribes of Indians, and it was way up this river. And we got there at the point where we could find people who said, I think I know what you're talking about, and I saw, as a child, I saw my father prepare this thing, but I have never done it myself, but I will attempt it for you. In other words, we were either too late 
or almost too late. And this situation is repeated over and over again. And it's not only hallucinogens, believe me. Uh, drugs of medicinal worth in all kinds of areas, antibiotics, uh, antidepressants, uh, uh, drugs which control malaria, drugs which control intestinal parasites uh, and knit bones, and all of these things are in danger of being lost because uh, the cultures are being so spectacularly disrupted by consumer capitalism. No one is taking care to preserve this folkloric medical information and the physical plants which it addresses. We can never return to the state of primal innocence that prevailed on this planet 10,000 years ago. The best we can hope for is to cover our tracks and turn the planet into a garden and build machines which will pull all the plastic and metal and glass out of the soil and restore, conserve, and treasure. And uh, this applies to the folk knowledge of these aboriginal and pre-literate people who, as we penetrate the implications of the psychedelic experience, will be seen to be, in some areas, in advance of us in, our, in their mapping of what all this means. We are not the most advanced culture on the planet. We are merely the most silicone technology advanced culture on the planet, but there's a great deal that we have to learn. However, we are the most destructive and corrosive culture on the planet. It is we who are destroying the Witoto and the Aguaruna Hivaro and the Kikuyu and all of these coherent human traditions that existed in equilibrium for 20, 30, 50,000 years until the advent of colonial imperialism a couple of hundred years ago. So I always try to argue from these extreme, people say I'm an escapist or that I just, it's, uh, you know, fluff, you can say anything. But really my goal is to change people's minds <laughs> and to show that the real situation supports the notion that we should change our minds, that we should revision these things, and that we should try to come to grips with all of the opportunities and all of the resources that humanity has amassed in its journey from the trees to the starship. You're listening to The Psychedelic Salon, where people are changing their lives one thought at a time. Ah, our journey from the trees to the starship. So ends the Bard McKenna today. And I'm beginning to think that these uh, starship references by him and Timothy Leary are trying to tell me something. But the truth is that I still have so many things that I want to do right here on Mother Earth that if our species heads into space, well, it's just going to have to leave people like me behind. You know, uh, there's been more than one occasion when I set off on some adventure uh, only to think better of it about halfway through. <laughs> so uh, I certainly don't want to uh, head out to join some space colony and have second thoughts right after blastoff. <laughs> of course, uh, that's obviously a decision that I'll never have to worry about. Okay, uh, since it seems like I'm on a lighthearted streak here, I just won't let this pass. And my point here is to, to show my own ignorance, which I blame primarily on focusing my formal studies on science and math more than I did on arts and literature, where I've now discovered is uh, where all the real action is. But what really gave me a chuckle and a pause to consult a dictionary was when Terence said, it's almost a linguistic strategy of conceptual syzygy. <laughs> now, if I tried to say something like that, it would no doubt sound phony, but uh, with Terence, it just seems to roll off his lips. A true bard he was... Or, at the very least, he was a most excellent storyteller with a great vocabulary. Okay, well, I've got to be honest here. As much as I enjoyed hearing Terence's talk just now, what I'd really like to talk about is uh, what's going on in the world. 
And uh, I'm talking, of course, about the Occupy movements that have sprung up all around the planet to express their own versions of the Occupy Wall Street uh, live-in that began on September 17th, which uh, I guess means that today is day 41, if I'm calculating correctly. And, uh, by the way, tomorrow is the end of the Mayan calendar, according to the followers of Kalaman's theories, which means that uh, if he's correct, you probably won't be listening to this anyway. Uh, But if you're here, then I guess uh, we need to look ahead to the next end of the world date, uh, December 21st, 2012, which I'm sure will also be followed by looking forward to yet another date for the apocalypse, uh, if that's the kind of thing you like to do. But getting back to my point, I'm not sure how I'm going to do this, to be quite honest, but for the indefinite future, I'm going to include something in every podcast about this global shift in consciousness that is now taking place. And please, uh, if you haven't been following this closely, please don't think that just because a few thousand people are sleeping out in public parks and other public spaces, that this is something small. I can't tell you why I have this feeling, but my hunch is that this is the big event. One that comes along not just once in a lifetime, but something that happens only once in an entire age. And, my gut feeling is, that like it or not, all of humanity is uh, perhaps, uh, for the first time ever, beginning a global conversation about how we want to structure our societies for the next thousand years or so, or at least for the next hundred years. And if this just isn't uh, for you right now, hey, uh, that's okay too. Uh, But I want you to know that after we hear each week's lecture or interview, just as we've been doing for over six years now, instead of me commenting on the talk, I'm going to do a segment about the latest news from the Occupy movements. And uh, hopefully you'll feel moved to add your voice to these podcasts in the form of email or, better yet, a little recorded bit from you about where you stand on what's going on. And just to uh, give you a little idea of some of the things that I've been hearing from impromptu interviews by people doing the live stream videos, I'm going to play two clips for you. The first one I'm going to play is a brief interview that I recorded over one of the Livestream.com feeds from the New York demonstration. It's an interview with the journalist Chris Hedges, who I've been following for a long time now and uh, have a very high opinion of his work. And uh, here's how he sees the events that are now underway. I'm Chris Hedges. Uh, I'm a writer. I write books. Uh, I spent 20 years overseas as a war correspondent. Came back and realized that uh, corporations had carried out a coup d'etat in my country. Uh, and I've been fighting back, although not as effectively as you guys. <laughs> Well, I've covered movements. I've covered all of the revolutions in Eastern Europe. I covered the street demonstrations that brought down Milosevic. I've covered both of the Palestinian intifadas. And uh, once movements like this start and articulate a fundamental truth about the society that they live in uh, and uh, expose the repression, the mendacity, the corruption, and the decay of the structures of power, uh, then they have a kind of centrifugal force. You never know where they're going. Uh, you know, I, I was with the leaders of the uh, movement, the opposition movement in East Germany in Leipzig on the afternoon of November 9th, 1989, and they said that perhaps within a year, there would be free passage back and forth across the Berlin Wall. In a few hours, the Berlin Wall didn't exist. What happens is, in all of these movements, this was true in Prague as well, is that the foot soldiers of the elite, the blue uniform police, uh, the mechanisms of control, uh, finally don't want to impede the movement. And at that point, uh, the power elite is left defenseless. So where is it going? No one knows. Even the people most uh, intimately involved in the organization don't know. Uh, they ha- this, all of these movements uh, take on a kind of life and color uh, that uh, is in some ways finally mysterious. Um, the only thing I can say, having been in the middle of 
similar movements is that this one is is real and um, and this one could take them all down if you had to, if you advise well let me first say I learn a lot more from the people who are occupying than uh, I mean I've I, my critique of the corporate state I think coalesces with the critique that many people in Occupy Wall Street have but I never wrote in any of my books about how to bring them down this whole uh, non-hierarchical structure is really brilliant and I didn't have a clue I didn't have a clue um, the because they can't they can't destroy the movement like that the, the fact that you rotate people through positions of leadership and the fact that you're completely transparent the fact that you realize that uh, you, you know, you've clearly been provoked. I mean, Anthony Bologna was, try I think, trying to provoke people in that crowd because they want windows smashed. What, they know how to handle that. They don't know how to handle this. This is driving them insane. And the fact is that I can guarantee you that huge segments of those blue uniform police sympathize with everything that you're doing. And that is the way you can, you can shatter the manacles of control uh, that that have been placed on the country by the corporate state, uh, and that's what that's what scares them. I mean, the most aggressive figures in the crowds are these white-shirted assholes. Um, and uh, I mean, okay, you, you remember, always remember that you only have to deal with them, you know, a, once in a while. These poor uniformed cops got to deal with them every day. Uh, I think the movement's really, 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 really smart, really astute. And um, uh, I don't really think I have much to teach it at all. I don't think there's any danger of this movement being uh, seduced or co-opted by MoveOn.org, which is a reprehensible organization, or the Democratic Party or anyone else, or the Teamsters. The fact is, what you've done what they have not done, which is fight back. And because you've fought back, they've been exposed for who they are, i.e. the leaders of this group. That's why they're running to you and attempting to restore what little shredded credibility they have left. You know, I'm a visitor. I come and go. But I don't sense that there's any danger. I, I think the, the, the sort of political consciousness of this group is so high uh, that uh, um, they see through all of these figures who show up the park. I mean, I was there when uh, Patterson showed up, Charlie Rangel showed up. Um, I mean, it's um, it, it's uh, it's sort of almost sad in a way, uh, and, and it, because the fact is they have uh, offered nothing, done nothing, except of course mouth this empty rhetoric, uh, this kind of feel your pain language while betraying the very people they purportedly represent. So I don't think there's any danger of this movement being co-opted at all. I think that, that, you know, even with the Teamsters, the union bosses, and these union bosses are pulling down five times what the rank and file is pulling down. They've done nothing for unions except basically barter away their benefits and rights. Uh, and in fact, you know, the union bosses have to get down here because otherwise they're going to lose their rank and file. That's why you're seeing groups like Move On or Teamsters coming down here, uh, because you do what their leadership has not done, which is stand up. And let me just say something. I wasn't here Friday morning. Uh, for me, I got kids. And, um, and, and it's all, it's not about me anymore. It's about the next generation. It's about my children's generation. And I think my passion for what you're doing, and I would even use the word love, comes from the fact that I, I look at you as fighting on behalf of like my little three-year-old. And when I, on Friday morning, of course I was up to find out what happened, and I did what I do now, which is start crying. God bless you all. And whether you were aware of it or not before now, you are the 99%. And like you, I'm damn proud of it. So just now we heard Chris Hedges say that movements like this uh, that speak a fundamental truth cannot be turned back. And so what is this fundamental truth, you ask? 
Well, that's kind of a slippery question in some ways because my guess is that virtually all of the 99% of us see the objectives uh, slightly different from one another. For me, the fundamental truth is that the societies most of us live in just are not fair. They're not just. They all seem to have different rules for the rich and the powerful than they do for the 99% of us who are doing all the heavy lifting. I see us at a magical point in human history right now that is completely unprecedented. And I'm talking about the fact that not only are people everywhere losing their fear of saying that the emperor has no clothes, but they're also connected to one another through the greatest communications network that has ever been built, the internet. With the net, we the people have a lever that is even bigger than all of the armies and guns that kings and dictators and emperors have used to subdue their citizens for centuries now. Granted, the U.S. has become the most screwed down police state since the Soviet Union in the 1950s, but with the power of the internet and all of the tools that are provided there, well, we can't be lied to anymore. We can watch the Oakland police attack demonstrators right as it's happening. And then we can see that same scene from a dozen different angles on YouTube. They may have the guns, but we have the tech. And since it's a key proviso of the Occupy movement that it be nonviolent, the cops are soon going to learn that provoking and attacking peaceful demonstrators will continue to backfire on them, as it already has. In fact, I think that you're going to see the movement grow significantly now after the cowardly attacks on nonviolent protesters at the Occupy Oakland demonstration, not to mention all of the other violent acts by police at other occupations. Now I know that the Oakland chief of police uh, yesterday said that they were attacked by the protesters and were defending themselves and also that the police didn't fire flash grenades but rather that the protesters were throwing firecrackers. Well, I spent most of that night watching what went down on several different live video streams, including the ABC News helicopter, which, along with the other network choppers, left the scene just before the police began their attack. And, you know, you can find hundreds of videos of this on the net already, and see for yourself that those weren't firecrackers going off, and that they quite obviously were thrown at the protesters by the police, as were rubber bullet shot and tear gas shot. Plus, the cops even had a sound cannon on hand. Uh, I didn't actually see them use it, but of course, you know, it's a military-grade weapon that's not even supposed to be used in the, uh, the U.S. or not even in the possession of the police, as far as I know. So, what's that all about? Now, I won't go on any more about the Oakland story, but you might want to watch some of the video yourself just to get a feel for how much of a military operation this was. There were hundreds of police there, and from the air, it even looked as if the cops outnumbered the demonstrators. But now I want to play one more audio clip, and this is also from the night before last at the Occupy Atlanta site, where the occupiers had been penned in and were waiting for the police to transport them to the police station since uh, they were all under arrest. The funny part was that the police bus broke down about a mile away, and uh, so the demonstrators had a good time laughing at the cops while everyone waited. But on the more serious side, here's what one of the people there had to say about why he was involved in this movement. My name is Benjamin Burchill. I am here because I'm one of those people that had a nice little corporate job a year ago. Uh, living three blocks from the beach, California, um, you know, working in risk management, learning how corporations are run from the inside out, um, yet being quite a countercultural person myself, and uh, ended up becoming homeless after losing uh, the job because my company was bought out by uh, three Chinese companies who decided they didn't need my, our subsidiary anymore. Um, and having spent over $70,000 in medical bills, uh, I simply had no money left. Um, and I learned that what I thought before about who this kind of stuff happens to was wrong. I used to think, oh, this kind of stuff happens to people that deserve it. They did something wrong. You know, they didn't plan correctly. They didn't manage the money right. Or, you know, and it's so not the case that so many of us are going through what we're going through through no part of our own. So it's taught me that these things can literally happen to anybody. 
and there's something wrong with that. <laughs> there's something wrong with, you know, the American boy who grew up being told that this was a, a country for everybody where you can work hard and get ahead and then have the rug snatched up, snatched from under you um, after doing what so-called were the right things. <laughs> and um, coming from California before I moved to Atlanta, um, one of the things that I became aware of living in the car myself was that this economic collapse has caused a boom in homelessness. And the boom is largely invisible because they don't necessarily look like the people that live here in this park. They look like people like me and like you that, you know, are dressed in regular jeans or, you know, some people still get up and put on their suit and go to their job where they make, you know, eight dollars an hour but they couldn't afford to stay in the house that they lived in anymore. Um, you know, they call that the mobile homeless, you know, living in their cars and their vans, people uh, even living with pets and, and uh, children in vehicles, just trying to survive because they could no longer afford to keep a house because they couldn't find a job uh, before they were being foreclosed on. So I'm here because I know there's something fundamentally wrong with our economic system, that there's something fundam fundamentally wrong with the idea that a corporation is a person and has rights to give money to political parties in whatever amounts they deem fit to sway our laws in their favor. They're not people. We're people. They're not citizens. We're citizens. And um, I think most of us who are coming to these movements really do understand that this is about economics, even if people don't know how to express it. And at rock bottom, it's about people's inability to put food in their, mouth, in their mouths, make sure their children are clothed, stay in the home that they have worked hard to pay for, and keep jobs that they shouldn't have lost to people in other countries who get paid slave wages to do the jobs that Americans should be doing. That's why I'm here. So, do you know anyone who is or has been in the same position as the young man we just heard from? I do, and my guess is that you do too. In a recent essay for truthout.org, Henry Garreau said about the demonstrations, They are not calling for reform, but for a massive rethinking and restructuring of the very meaning of politics, one that will be not only against the casino capitalism, which through the chimera of free markets rewards the financial and political elites at great social and environmental costs, but also for a restructuring of the notion of governance, rule of law, power relations, and the meaning of democratic participation. The current protests make clear that this is not, indeed cannot be, only a short-term project for reform, but a political and moral movement that needs to intensify, accompanied by the reclaiming of public spaces, the use of digital technologies, the development of public spheres, new modes of education and the safeguarding of places where democratic expression, new identities and collective hope can be nurtured and mobilized. It is important to recognize that what young people and many others are now doing is making a claim for a democratically informed politics that embraces the public good, economic justice and social responsibility. So, now how about you adding your own two cents, as the saying goes, about how you see all of this. And I'll tell you why I think this is so important to us here in the Psychedelic Salon. Stop and think for a moment about the big what-if questions. What if, by some miracle, this really is the big shift, the big transformation of human consciousness that Teilhard and other mystics have foreseen? What if this time, thanks in no small part to the Internet, it really works? What if we've now had a large enough dose of freedom that it'll take us over the threshold into that place of awareness many of us know exists because, well, we've been there before? What if we are now at the very beginning of a long process that will eventually restructure how cultures and societies work and interact with one another? Well, if that's what's going on, don't you want to have a say in it too? After all, we're all part of the Genesis generation now, and as Gandhi once said, 
Whatever you do will be insignificant, but it is very important that you do it. And my personal opinion is that the worldwide psychedelic community has a lot of fine ideas that should be added into the mix. So what I've done is to set up a new email address just for the purpose of receiving your reports from the Occupy movements that uh, you might be following, either on the net or in person. I'd like to hear the opinions of as many of our fellow saloners as want to add their voices to the mix. And the email address you should use is Lorenzo at OccupySalon.us. That's Lorenzo at, all one word, OccupySalon.us. And uh, depending on how it goes, we may even set up a blog at that address that our community can use to uh, share thoughts on our objectives in this new global conversation that has just begun. Well, that's going to do it for now, and so I'll close today's podcast by reminding you that this and most of the podcasts from the Psychedelic Salon are freely available for you to use in your own audio projects under the Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike 3.0 license. And if you have any questions about that, just uh, click the Creative Commons link at the bottom of the Psychedelic Salon webpage, which you can get to via psychedelicsalon.us. And for now, this is Lorenzo obviously with a slight head cold, (laughs) signing off from Cyberdelic Space. Be well, my friends, and uh, to give you a little ride out on your way out of the salon today, I'm going to play something by one of our fellow saloners, John Tackett, who wrote and recorded his song titled Homeless Land No. 9, and about which John says, To me, it's all about the cause, in which I believe we have a tribal goal. So let's give it a listen. Shoes on my feet, say my feet are cold, and I'm growing old. Don't know what to do, drifting through and through. This is where I stand. Welcome to my world. What the homeless land? All alone, so alone, and I'm looking for my home. I can smell the food But where our money goes Only no one knows Maybe overseas To end disease But what about this place Welcome to my world Welcome to homeless Land All alone So alone And I'm looking for my home Oh, my